All right, everyone, welcome. We're going to go ahead and get started. If you have any questions or problems while we're talking, please feel free to chat in the chat box, as some people are doing already, um, and we'll respond to you as quickly as possible. All of your lines at this time are muted um, so that we can make sure that there's as little disruption as possible while we're going through these slides. But at the end, we're going to give you an option to unmute your phones if you have any questions. Um, so for now, just hold tight. We've got a lot of content that we're going to go through and uh, expect that there'll be some questions at the end. Um, so welcome to today's webinar focusing on the local implementation site application for the National Quality Improvement Center on tailored services, placement stability, and permanency for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgendered, and questioning children and youth in foster care. That is a very long title, and so moving forward, I'm just going to reference this as the quick. So here you can see your two presenters for the day. Um, you're here, you will hear from me, Marlene Matarese, and Elizabeth Greeno. I'm the principal investigator on this project, and Elizabeth is a lead evaluator. Uh, the QUIC is led by the Institute for Innovation and Implementation at the University of Maryland School of Social Work, along with our core partners, the Human Service Collaborative, the National Indian Child Welfare Association, the Ruth Ellis Center, Tufts University, and Youth Motivating Others Through Voices of Experience National. Um, we want to dedicate the time during this webinar to the application process, so I'm encouraging you to visit our website for more information on the QUIC and the team for the application materials. Um, you'll hear us referencing that website throughout this process, so you see it here. Please free, feel free to email as well if you have any questions. Um, so the QUIC is funded through the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Administration for Children, Youth, and Families Children's Bureau, and Kathy Compain is our government project officer. Um, Kathy is on the line. Would you like to say a few words, Kathy? Sure. Thank you, Marlene. So my name is Kathy Compain, and I'm the National Foster Care Specialist at the Children's Bureau. Um, in this role, I manage several grants, uh, including the QUIC uh, for short. Uh, under a five-year cooperative agreement with the University of Maryland's School of Social Work. We are really excited for this opportunity to develop and implement strategies that support greater placement stability, permanency, and the provision of appropriate services for LGBTQ2S children and youth in foster care. And we'll work closely with four to six projects that will contribute to the development of evidence-informed and evidence-based programs addressing the needs of this population. Next, we'll quickly highlight some of the key issues regarding the need for this work, as well as the expectations of the QUIC itself and the project sites under this grant uh, before delving into the application details. Uh, so as Marlene mentioned, there will be a lot of information to cover in the next hour and a half. Um, and I welcome all of you to this presentation and to this discussion. So I'll turn it back over to Marlene. OK, great. Thanks, Kathy. Yes. Uh, so many of you have joined this call and you're interested in this application because you already know the risk and protective factors that children and youth with diverse sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression, or SOGI as I'll call it throughout this presentation, um, that they're experiencing and the specific concerns related to permanency, stability, and well-being for these young people who are also in the foster care system. You know, we know from the literature and many of our experiences actually working directly with LGBTQ2S youth that these young people are more likely to experience um, physical, sexual abuse, verbal abuse, um, substance abuse, suicidal behaviors, mental health concerns such as depression, as well as homelessness, bullying, and discrimination. Um, these young people have been found to be disproportionately represented in the child welfare system and are more likely to have placements in foster and group homes with lower re rates of reunification for the, with their families of origin. Um, and there are also a significant number of protective factors that we know actually work when working with these young people to increase permanency, stability, and well-being. Um, this is just a quick synopsis of some of the risk factors that we know. Um, uh, we've also provided you with a more in-depth literature review that can be found on the website. And we also sent it out in the email that many of you, I believe, received. So please feel free to check that out so that you can have some more information on some of the background of why this is so important, um, as well as information on the evidence-based practices that are out there and evidence-informed practices and promising approaches that we are aware of. Um, so to address these needs that I just briefly mentioned of uh, that 
youth with diverse SOGI in foster care are facing. The QUIC is going to work to develop, integrate, and sustain best practices and programs that improve outcomes for children and youth in foster care with diverse SOGI. Um, our goal is to identify and fund four to six local implementation sites, lead the cross-site evaluation process, lead the quick quality uh, learning collaborative, provide technical assistance, training, and resources. And that's just an overview. We're actually going to dig more into all of that throughout this presentation so you can get a better perspective on what it's going to look like if you're selected to be a local implementation site. So our hope is that many of you on this call will be part of the application to become a local implementation site. The local implementation sites are going to work to identify, select, adapt, implement, and evaluate evidence-based, evidence-informed, or promising programs and practices that address the unique needs of these young people with diverse SOGI and foster care. We know that there are limited interventions that are actually out there that are evidence-based or evidence-informed that have been designed specifically for this population which, you know, is the reason for the Children's Bureau's funding and support for this work. Um, so again, please see the literature review for a more comprehensive list of models um, that could be in included in your application and your proposal. Um, we want to make sure that, um, we want to make it clear that sites can also choose more than one intervention in their application. And uh, if you choose more than one intervention, Regardless, at least one of those interventions must be a direct practice intervention for children, youth, or caregivers. Uh, applicants may choose to adapt an evidence-based practice, evidence-informed practice, or promising practice that has not been used with LGBTQ2S children and youth. Or applicants may decide to implement and evaluate a practice that they're doing locally that has not yet been evaluated and is not in the literature. When we started out this process, we actually contacted programs to find out if there was more work being done and if that sites had gone through a rigorous evaluation process and we just weren't seeing it in the literature. And what we found is that very often those sites hadn't gone through that process and so that's why we weren't seeing that in the literature. Um, and we understand that providers just might not be able to engage in that kind of rigorous evalu evaluation and that this could be an opportunity to support that. Um, the services, supports, and interventions that are implemented through the implementation sites will be comprehensive, culturally responsive, trauma-informed, and aimed at enhancing individualized services for children and youth with diverse SOGI and foster care, as well as the skills and abilities of caregivers of children and youth with diverse SOGI and the child welfare workforce, contracted providers, or system partners. The right thing. I'm sorry. Um, so each local implementation site in partnership with the QUIC and the Children's Bureau will strive to improve placement stability, well-being, and permanency of children and youth with diverse SOGI and foster care by creating safe and welcoming environments for children and youth to self-identify, enhancing assessment methods and processes that are strength-based, culturally responsive, trauma-informed, and that safeguard confidentiality, and that includes data collection. Um, provide culturally responsive, individualized, accessible, and tailored evidence-based or evidence-informed services or promising approaches to meet the specific needs of these children and youth with diverse SOGI and foster care. Establishing and implementing permanency innovations for those not yet reunified with their families of origin and increasing knowledge, skills, and competence of and responsive, responsive by the child welfare workforce, providers, and caregivers, which could be foster and non-foster families and providers that are in congregate care settings of children and youth with diverse SOGI. Again, we want to reiterate the expectation for local implementation sites to implement one or more interventions, as well as work in partnership with the QUIC and the Children's Bureau throughout the entire project. Local implementation sites will also need to participate in a mutually binding contractual relationship with us at the University of Maryland, Baltimore. I'm going to discuss that in more detail. You should also note in the quick app application materials that there's a sample um, of the uh, contract that we have here at the University of Maryland for you to start looking at. Um, and additionally, sites are expected to establish an evaluation plan, collect data, and share data with the QUIC team and participate in a quality learning collaborative, which we're also going to discuss in more detail. 
so moving on to eligibility, uh, we have received many questions so far related to eligibility. We know this is something that many of you on this call may also have questions about. And I hope that we've responded to a lot of the questions and that also you're going to have your questions answered on this webinar um, and through the application materials. But we're absolutely happy to have um, additional conversations or provide additional information if needed around eligibility. Um, so who can apply? Um, eligible applicants are limited to state governments, county governments, and Native American tribal governments that are federally recognized. The reason for this is that we want to ensure that local implementation sites have both access and authority to assess and make systematic changes in the child welfare system. The lead agency, which again is the lead state, county, or tribal, tribal government entity, is expected to directly manage every aspect of the work and may not, and may not subcontract this responsibility to another entity. Um, the application must designate the lead staff person from the applicant agency. If you are operating in a county-driven system, um, then a county may apply. But if you're operating in a state-driven system, the state entity must be the lead applicant. We also receive questions around states that have privatized their child welfare system. And so we just want to make sure that it's clear that even if you're functioning within a privatized system, the lead state agency must be the lead applicant and not the local contract providers. Um, with that said, we also know that the primary applicants are going to want and need to contract with private agencies as contributors and strategic partners um, that will add ex additional expertise where child welfare services are provided. Um, so if you're a provider on this call, which when we saw the list, we did see a significant number of providers. Um, we actually encourage you to reach out to your lead child welfare agencies to support this application and lead the application process. process. Um, with the possibility of you being a contracted contributor. Um, but again, if you are a provider, then you're not able to apply independently for this, um, this funding. Um, independent subawardees are prohibited. So your subcontractor can be a vendor that provides expert services, but it cannot independently manage part of the work. Additionally, individuals, foreign entities, and sole proprietorship organizations are not eligible. Each partnering agency must demonstrate recognition of and commitment to the application um, as the lead agency, and the application needs to include a designated lead staff. Yeah. Okay. Again, because we are aiming for systematic change, we're requiring that child welfare agencies take an active role in the QUIC and should lead and coordinate efforts between any strategic partners, um, as well as steady and continuous communication around training and technical assistance that will be provided for, from and with the QUIC. Um, a strong application should include how the primary applicant will coordinate and evaluate its interventions, maintain continuous quality improvement, and sustain reporting requirements with the QUIC. Uh, additionally, primary applicants must show multi-level support from agency and government leadership. All right, with that, I'm going to move on to the actual applic application. And there's a lot of details in this, so kind of bear with me as I go through each question and portion of the application. The application is divided into different categories and subsections, as you probably have seen, around need and population, the intervention model, evaluation, feasibility, and capacity, the implementation plan, local implementation site commitment to the QUIC, key personnel, budget and budget narrative, and then additional information. And so we're going to walk through each of these elements. The first section of the application is around need and population. Um, in this section, we want to understand what the local needs are for youth with diverse SOG and foster care, including the demographic makeup of these youth and geographic location. Additionally, applicants should describe the SOGI supportive practices and policies that your system has implemented and uh, describe why participation in the QIF will actually enhance the quality and cultural responsiveness of the services and supports that you already have established in your area. This is particularly important um, just for clarity. We're actually not looking for sites that are starting from scratch. Um, we want to see that there's um, elements that you're already doing that can be built on because funding is limited, as is the time frame for implementation. So we need to make sure that you have a foundation that we can help grow and support 
um, during this process. Um, and so we want to make sure that in the application you're establishing what those elements are that you're already doing and how you're going to leverage that. Um, applicants will need to describe why you selected your intervention model based on your local needs and any aspects already in place to support the work. Um, you'll also be able, you'll also need to describe your ability to identify and serve these young people with diverse SOGI and foster care um, and focus on the population of youth between the age of 14 and 21, uh, the child welfare workforce, family and caregivers of youth with diverse SOGI, contracted providers or the youth themselves, uh, reducing risk factors, which is noted in the literature review, and enhancing protective factors for youth with diverse SOGI. Um, and as well as the main primary overarching uh, reason for this whole project is enhancing stability, permanence, and well-being for these young people. The next section in the application is the intervention model. Applicants are required to select a minimum of two of the focus areas. Um, I'm going to describe those focus areas below. We also recognize that many of these focus areas are interconnected and applicants may describe how they want to address all of these focus areas over the course of the four-year project. So the focus areas are culturally appropriate methods for safe identification, assessment of individual needs, and data collection related to the population of focus, demographics, and permanency, well-being, and placement stability outcomes with an attention to addressing confidentiality and privacy issues, engagement in effective community, group, family, and individual services, placement stability supports to children, youth, and caregivers, including birth families and reunification situations, permanency innovations for those not reunified with families of origin, and increased knowledge, competence, and responsiveness of youth with diverse SOGI by agency staff, caregivers, and service providers, um, service providers that are working in congregate care settings. So con to continue with the intervention model section, as I mentioned, at least one identified intervention must be a direct practice intervention for children, youth, and or caregivers. Of course, you may also include additional interventions that are aimed at addressing systematic changes such as the workforce, policy initiatives, or system enhancing interventions. Applicants should describe specific permanency, well-being, and placement stability outcomes for each of the focus areas that you have selected as well as describing the evidence-based practice, evidence-formed practices, or promising practices, as well as tribal best practices that you will implement to reach the outcomes of the selected focus areas. Um, applicants will want to provide any additional research and literature available on the effectiveness of the identified interventions, including instruments or measures that will be used in assessing fidelity of the proposed interventions if they are available. And, you know, we recognize that a site's chosen intervention may not be manualized. It may not have fidelity instruments because it hasn't been part of a rigorous evaluation, and that's okay. Um, we are just expecting that applicants describe in as much detail as possible why this intervention will best meet the needs of youth. Um, with diverse SOGI and foster care and in foster care in your area. Um, and the quick will work with you through that process. If you choose to implement an intervention that doesn't have these things yet, um, we'll work with you to start developing fidelity instruments and engaging in this more rigorous evaluation. Um, applicants should describe any existing tailored services provided to meet um, the specific needs of youth with diverse SOGI and foster care um, and how you're going to leverage existing services um, and work around LGBTQS topics um, in your state. Um, the next section is the implementation plan. Applicants will need to describe your readiness and the feasibility of your implementation plan based on local implementation factors, uh, which should also include challenges, opportunities, and how your plan integrates um, or is building on current work. Again, because we want to see how you're leveraging um, local resources, your current local capacity, which includes infrastructure, roles, and responsibilities of the lead agency and partner agency, uh, and your day-to-day -day operations. Um, we're also interested in seeing um, information about your collaboration with providers, system partners, and stakeholders locally, um, and system conditions, and around how your community and agency climate is inclusive to LGBTQ2S young people. 
Applicants will need to describe program specifics, including the population of focus, eligibility criteria for enrollment and referral mechanisms, as well as partners that will be involved, and how the site will support workforce development. Uh, Youth Move National will also provide support um, as you're working through some of the topics um, that you may be experiencing as we move on to the implementation plan here continued. Um, it's really important that we want to make sure that um, young people are actually engaged as partners to inform the design, implementation, and oversight of the interventions. Um, you know, we believe, and I'm sure many of you believe, that young people who've experienced the system should have meaningful leadership roles in implementation. Um, and we're looking for sites to implement and articulate um, a plan around how they're going to implement young people being involved. Um, and again, YouthMove is going to support that process by providing TA throughout the length of this project. Um, and, you know, of course, we also encourage and would like to see um, from sites on how they're also engaging um, parents and caregivers of youth with diverse SOGI in the process um, around implementing these interventions as well. Um, applicants are going to need to describe the estimated number of children and youth who will be served over the life of the project. Um, their strategies for integrating intervention models within policies, programs, and practices, and plans to develop systematic change, um, systemic change, I'm sorry, uh, strategies for implementing services within 90 days of receiving funding. And so this one, I think, should stick out for all of you who have implemented a practice model that 90 days is quick. Um, so we completely understand if these timeframes are going to be challenging for some of the sites and that implementation may take some additional time. If when you're writing this application and you're planning out your implementation plan that you have concerns about your ability to actually implement services within 90 days, please explain those barriers and provide an updated timeline. We would prefer that applicants actually be realistic and honest so that we can plan accordingly and don't skew what you think is realistic for your site because you're worried that you're not going to be considered if you do that. Um, we would actually prefer that and we'll work with you if you're going to be a selected site to figure out what is a timeline that makes sense and that we can actually manage. Um, so next we'll move on to evaluation, feasibility, and capacity. And I'm going to pass the phone over and actually stop talking for a little bit to Elizabeth Greeno, who's the lead evaluator, and we'll walk through this process. Um, overall, the evaluation at QUIC is going to include a rigorous local and cross-site cross evaluation of each of the LIS and interventions, with, of course, the ultimate goal of the QUIC being to promote permanency, safety, and well-being of our LGBTQ youth in the child welfare system. Um, I'm going to dive into each of these a little later in the presentation, but we want to give you a, an overview of evaluation feasibility and capacity. Um, so local evaluation capacity and commitment um, with the QUIC evaluation team for evaluation research is going to include a local data manager. And what we're asking is for each of the sites to have um, a data manager that has at least 20% full-time effort devoted to this project. Um, and then in your application, please describe your proposed sampling strategy. For example, who you're going to recruit, who's going to receive services, um, and how you're going to um, go about doing that. For each proposed intervention, we're asking um, for sites to describe how participants are selected, how you expect them to participate, um, and whether you're able to have a compar um, comparison um, group or not. So if, if your participants will be able to be compared to similar individuals who did not participate. Um, please provide us an uh, estimated sample size and describe possible measures that you will be utilized. Um, and in addition, um, we'd like you to please explain um, or indicate your eligibility or, pardon me, ability to access, collect, and analyze data. So data sources may include one or more of the following, your child welfare administrative data, Medicaid claims or other types of administrative data, surveys, focus groups, interviews, um, and if they can be co conducted at multiple time points. Um, any workforce data, and then program-specific data. Um, please indicate your ability to, co to collect and share the data with the QUIC team, um, including the measures referenced above. Um, and if you have any foreseen barriers or 
um, challenges if you could identify how you're going to address these barriers. For example, um, access to your child welfare administrative data. Uh, please describe your continued quality improvement process and how your agency will modify interventions based on project and outcome findings or the, over the course of the project. Um, please describe data collection procedures and your process for ensuring confidentiality. Um, and then in regards to that, please describe any institutional review board or human subject regulatory processes or procedures specific to your agency, site, state, or tribe um, which you're applying. Your agency may not have a formal IRB, um, Institutional Review Board procedure, um, but you should have a process for ensuring that youth involvement and caregiver involvement um, and research projects are protected. And then as relevant, please describe your team's experience in working with these regulatory um, groups um, any potential challenges that you think may arise. Okay. Um, so as I mentioned before, family and youth-centered planning and family and youth-driven care are critical to this process, as well as positive youth development and cultural and linguistic competency and responsiveness. Applicants should describe their commitment to these values in the application process. Additionally, applicants should show how the Child Welfare Agency and Provider Partner Programs will provide safe spaces for children and youth with diverse SOGI to self-identify um, by describing what trauma-informed strategies the Child Welfare Agency and Provider Program will employ and how you will address risk and protective factors, as well as methods for assessing strengths and needs, the process to garner meaningful youth participation and utilization of their expertise in all stages of implementation throughout the duration of this project, as well as that from caregivers and parents. Uh, selected applicants will be required to enter into the mutually binding contractual agreement with us at the University of Maryland, as I mentioned. Um, we do a lot of contracts with other state agencies. We are a state agency in Maryland, um, and we know that negotiating the contractual language can take months between state agencies um, over just a simple sentence or, you know, word. Um, and so we want to make sure that this process goes along much more quickly. In an effort to do that, as I mentioned, we provided you with a sample of what the contractual language will look like. And so we are asking you to share this sample with your contracting body, whoever it is that actually will sign this contract, to review it um, to ensure that language negotiations are actually going to be possible. And if you have concerns or if your agency has concerns about the language that's in the contract, if you could note that in the application, that would be helpful. Because when we see that, we'll be able to know whether or not with our contracting body if a negotiation is an option um, or if there's any challenges that we think we're going to have. We want to meet that ahead of time so that if you are selected to be a local implementation site, we can move quickly and don't spend months in the process of just trying to get a contract thrown. Um, as I mentioned, the lead agency commitment is important to this process, and applicants will need to describe the long-term level of commitment from leadership within the Child Welfare Agency and provider partners around diverse SOGI, children, youth with diverse SOGI, um, as well as your past and current work addressing these needs. Um, I'm actually going to describe the Quick Quality Learning Collaborative in more detail as we get through this presentation. But briefly, um, sites are going to need to describe their commitment to actively participating in the Quick Quality Learning Collaborative and the meetings that are associated with that. So that includes uh, the capacity for four to five key implementation staff to travel to sites for these meetings. That will happen six times over the course of the grant. Um, the QUIC, us, are actually going to cover the cost of those travel costs. Um, so you don't have to worry about that in your budgets, but we need to make sure that your staff are able to travel out of state. Um, the willingness to learn and share practice, policy, and organizational les lessons with um, your peers throughout the learning collaborative process um, and share data, because there's going to be a big portion of it that's around cross-site data sharing um, so that we can promote that learning and implementation enhancements throughout the process. Uh, the next section is key personnel. This is probably pretty self-explanatory um, for those of you who have written grants before, um, but you need to describe the key personnel that are going to be involved in the implementation process, including individuals that are responsible for data collection, 
um, and working with a quick evaluation team. Applicants should describe the roles and FTE associated with the work, as well as the hiring agency of each of the individuals that are listed. Um, the next section is the budget and budget narrative section. Applicants are going to need to provide a detailed budget and budget narrative that's inclusive of the key personnel required to implement the proposal with their FTE, salary, and fringe, as well as materials, supplies, stipends, and other expenses. Applicants should describe their arrangement with each strategic partner, including that partner's specific budget, um, their budget narrative, and the scope of work that's associated with that partner. And the last section of the application is additional information. Um, this final section is actually not required, um, but we do encourage you to include as much information as possible because that's going to be helpful to us in the selection of sites. Um, information can be uploaded as separate documents or can be included as an appendix section in the application. Um, this could include um, any additional information that would demonstrate what your site brings to this application process because, again, we're looking for sites that do have a foundation to build on. So if you have brochures, policies, videos, pictures, interviews, training curricula, anything along those lines that you think would be important for us to see in making our decision, um, as well as letters of commitment from some of your strategic partners that you might include, um, or support from the community, we would love to see that. For each of the additional information that you do include, please provide information on its purpose, intended, audi intended audience, and the dissemination approach, so what you actually did with that and how you uh, disseminated that information throughout your agency or throughout the community. Again, not required, but it would be really helpful so that we can get a good picture of the work that's going on within your site. The application deadline, um, I hope all of you saw that we had some delays here on the East Coast with snow and closures, and so we got the application out a little bit uh, later than we had hoped, and so we extended the deadline by a week. Um, so all applications must be received by April 28th, 2017, by 11.59 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, you should mail, email your application to our quick email address that's listed here and we will make sure that you receive, you'll get an automated response that we received it, but we'll also let you know um, with an individualized response that, you, that we received it no later than May 1st by 5 p.m. Eastern time. If it, on May 1st at 5 p.m. Eastern you have not received a response from us, please contact us because we want to make sure that we didn't miss it or something didn't go through in the submission process. So with that, I'm going to pass this over to Elizabeth, again, to talk more uh, in depth about the evaluation requirements. Okay. All applicants should provide a description of initial evaluation methodologies, uh, and that's for each intervention um, that you're choosing. Sites that are able to clearly articulate evaluation plans are going to be awarded higher points. Um, and descriptions should include your proposed sample, including your sample size, and I'll actually talk more about that in a second, your ability to access child welfare administrative data, your willingness to collect primary data from youth, caregivers, and or providers, any additional evaluation measures and outcomes that you're interested in collecting, and then possible comparison groups. And again, to reiterate, all applicants should identify a data manager who will be responsible for data collection and analyses activities, and that person should be at at least 20% full-time effort devoted to the project. Data collection and analysis activities will, of course, be dependent upon the type of intervention or interventions chosen by each site. And data may include one or more of the following, child welfare administrative data, Medicaid claims or other administrative data, surveys and focus groups, inter interviews, um, and that may be conducted at multiple time points, workforce data, and program-specific data. Um, for the quick evaluation design, um, we'll, we will evaluate, um, the, pardon me, there will be three main evaluation components of each LIS and cross-site. A process evaluation that's going to be designed to ask um, how much did we do and how did we go about doing it. So this is designed to guide implementation and provide performance feedback and periodic assessments to each LIS. 
the implementation evaluation that assesses how well did we do it. Um, and this goes about um, by evaluating adherence to your selected intervention or interventions, practice training, or other models chosen. An outcome evaluation that answers, is anyone better off, by assessing short and long-term goals of the project. And each evaluation should include a mixed methods, qualitative, quantitative approach. For your process evaluation, a process evaluation um, for the, the quick research team will use National Implementation Research Network guidelines in assessing um, the amount of services provided, the implementation of interventions. And implement, implementation of interventions will include the description of the context in which the program components are implemented. And depending on each site, we may consider using a readiness for implementation measure at the start of your project. Assessment of goals and objectives versus actual implementation. The sequencing of your events and activities related to implementation. A description of major program components or services and account of any variances of those. Assessment of referral, recruitment, and enrollment and retention. And then measurement selection and implementation. And documentation of costs associated. A cross-site evaluation will document the amount of technical assistance and other services that each LIS will receive in order to give us an overall picture of quick activities. The implementation evaluation that measures how well did we do it will look specifically at adherence to the intervention or interventions, model fidelity, practice changes, and training, and then continuous feedback will be presented to each site. Um, we will probably have monthly, at a minimum, contact with each site um, so that you really know where you stand in terms of implementation. Uh, and the evaluation will also look at using surveys, interviews, and focus groups with key informants and stakeholders, in addition to other qualitative and quantitative techniques. Cross-site implementation evaluation would include interviews with each LIS um, and, of course, support from the QUIC. For the overall QUIC evaluation, the questions of how well the QUIC was implemented will be answered through um, documents of um, leadership meetings, consultant poll, and other surveys with your QUIC partners. The outcome evaluation, which measures is anyone better off, um, is going to look at outcomes and evaluations that will be tailored to in intervention and site. When possible and if feasible, the use of comparison groups will be used to explore outcomes um, of alternative or treatment as usual approaches. Possible outcome measures may include, but of course are not limited to, um, staff acquisition of skills or knowledge, clinical outcomes for youth, effectiveness of program services, impact on improving child welfare outcomes for youth. Each LIS will be asked to implement at least one identical measure to allow for cross-site comparison. And each LIS team will be surveyed for feedback on the effectiveness of the quick um, technical assistance in promoting service array changes in the areas of permanency, placement stability, and well-being for LGBTQ children and youth. We will work with each site on sampling strategies. And sampling strategies and potential sample sizes will be dependent, of course, on the selected interventions. But we will work with you so that there's a strategy aimed at ensuring that intended recipients for the selected interventions are selected and that sample sizes are suitable enough to allow for detection of statistically significant effects. So the overall role of the quick evaluation team is that we will work collaboratively with each LIS throughout each phase of the evaluation process. Um, from developing logic models and evaluation plans to actually doing the um, analyses and interpretation of implementation reports or other dissemination efforts. We will work um, with the data collect we will work with you on data collection methods and we will train the data manager, the full time 20% um, data manager is at a full time, pardon me, 20% effort on the project. We will review and clean data and hold at a minimum bi monthly calls to address any discrepancies with data. We will help each site design a dashboard-style bi-monthly implementation report. We'll schedule monthly calls and on-site visits as needed. And we'll hold quarterly meetings to support 
and the adherence with data collection and cleaning protocols, and to discuss findings and trends. Great, thank you. Um, so I wanted to take just a few moments to talk about the Quick Quality Learning Collaborative and provide you with some details on what that's going to entail because it's core to how we're implementing. Um, and it also, um, you know, is pretty involved. We want to make sure that as you're submitting this application, there's clarity on the expectations. Um, so the first uh, of the learning collaboratives will launch in the fall of 2017. We anticipate it will probably be around November. Um, it's just going to depend on how quickly um, we can get contracts finalized and funding to sites and that people are up and ready to physically go on site um, to have our first uh, quality learning collaborative. So our process uses the Permanency Innovations uh, Initiative approach and follows the model of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement Breakthrough Series Collaborative. Um, and all of this work is grounded in the National Implementation Research Network, um, key implementation drivers across the stages of implementation. If the words I just said don't make any sense to you, um, I encourage you to look it up. All of that information is out there. Um, we will provide more information on this for the sites that are selected so you can really be grounded in what this means and um, what the process is going to look like. Um, we just don't have time to do that in depth on this call today, but all of it's accessible online. And if you have questions, please feel free to email and we'll give you as much information as possible. Um, to participate in the Quality Learning Collaborative, local implementation sites are required to establish teams of four to five people who represent key roles and functions that are necessary to implement the intervention successfully. These people may include executive leadership, clinical staff, evaluators, caregivers, young people, or other systems partners. Uh, the sites will participate in cross-team learning um, and sharing of information and resources, as well as regular calls. Uh, we expect in the beginning, at least for a while, that those calls will happen monthly. Um, we are definitely a group of people that listens, and so if the calls get to a point to where they're not as helpful and people would like to go bi-monthly or you know, have calls less or more frequently, we will adjust accordingly. Um, and then participation in those in-person um, learning sessions, of which there will be six. So the learning sessions are a critical component of the learning collaborative, and it's really an opportunity for those of you who have never participated in a learning collaborative to connect with the people that are doing similar work to you and to learn from each other. Um, I know I've participated in them and I've led them, and they have been very helpful to me in the work that we do um, to make sure that we're consistently doing better. And in the areas where we are doing really well, sharing that information and helping other sites is a really great process to participate in. And so we hope you know, that the local implementation sites experience that as well. Um, the learning sessions will include local presentations from the sites on their current implementation successes and, and challenges, and will also allow time for cross-site data sharing as well as technical assistance. And so throughout this process, we'll be working with sites outside of these formalized meetings to just talk to you and see what things, you know, like what's going on and what are some of the needs that you have, some of which may be really specific. And we will have a consultant pool um, that will be available to you, which I'll describe as well, um, to provide technical assistance to you around those topics. During these learning sessions, we'll also be bringing in experts. So if we find that there's a consistent pattern across all of the implementation sites to where they really need information on a specific topic, we're going to have someone take some time to present on that so all of the sites can experience that. And there will also be time for the sites to meet with um, uh, one of the coaches as part of the quick to kind of move you guys through the stages into that next step of what you're actually going to be doing in between the learning uh, sessions. So these learning um, sessions are consisting of two-day in-person meetings, and we are hopeful to kind of rotate these to the different local implementation sites so that people have a chance to see the work that's going on locally and for sites to be able to host us. Um, and again, the QUIC is going to cover the cost for travel, um, all of the travel-related costs to these meetings. This process is going to walk us through um, something that's called Plan, Do, Study, Act cycles. Um, so the Quality Learning Collaborative is going to help the local implementation site move to that next implementation stage by walking through their next plan, do, study, act cycle. And so what that means is that 
local implementation sites are going to plan what they're actually going to do to achieve their goal, have an opportunity to try it in practice, um, observe the results through evaluation and just lessons learned, and then act by determining what modifications are needed and how we're going to refine the approach locally. And so, you know, we don't expect that any site is going to implement and that first month of implementation is going to be amazing um, and everything is going to be perfect and there's not going to be any kinks. Anyone who's implemented anything knows that that's just not possible. Um, and we want to make sure that sites are growing and learning and that we're learning from each other. Um, and so this process will kind of guide us through that over the course of the project. Um, and then during the action periods that are in between the learning sessions, the local implementation sites are going to be connected through those conference calls that I mentioned, webinars, individualized technical assistance, and then web-based resources that will come out. You know, like we anticipate and have staffed ourselves to make sure that sites are going to have a significant amount of technical assistance that, you know, hopefully is wanted. Um, and that's going to be individualized to the needs that you identify if you're selected as a site. This next slide is just a graphic of kind of what to expect of the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth uh, quality learning collaborative. And it kind of walks through the implementation stages that we expect to kind of see for sites. Um, through, you know, initial implementation, getting to the point in, at the end of this to where implementation is full and complete and successful and that there's a formative evaluation attached to it. Um, and that this process, again, is going to go throughout the length of the project. Um, <clears throat> so it's a big commitment to join as a local implementation site and to be selected and to participate in this quality learning collaborative. I just want to reiterate that, you know, we are committed to providing the, you know, level and appropriate intensiveness of support to the sites that are selected. Um, you know, we aim to provide technical assistance that's responsive and that's tailored to your individualized needs. Um, and it, it could include the quality learning collaborative monthly calls, as I mentioned, in-person in meetings. Um, and just the participation in the quality learning collaborative as a whole. Culturally specific technical assistance um, to select selected uh, American Indian or Alaskan Native uh, tribes. Uh, assistance in designing a local implementation, site implementation, evaluation, data collection, and monitoring plans. Um, access to a pool of national experts, including young people and caregivers from diverse communities to provide flexible and responsive on-site and virtual technical assistance. Um, the TA from these consultants will be provided for limited periods at no cost to the local implementation sites. I do want to note, however, that this does not include the cost related to a selected intervention. So if you do select an intervention to where there's costs associated to, um, with implementation of that practice model, this doesn't cover those costs. That would need to be included in the budget that you develop um, for the larger project. Um, Support in identifying implementation barriers and strategies for addressing barriers. Ongoing webinars, resources, and supports around the necessary implementation components, as well as strategies for successful implementation, data collection, and evaluation. Um, we are also offering from one of our partners, the Ruth Ellis Center, um, baseline introductory training um, for the identified workforce, uh, caregivers, and young people. That training approach, um, you know, we, we partnered with the Ruth Ellis Center because they do amazing work and they actually are still doing work with young people and their families. Um, they just bring tremendous expertise in working with this population of young people who are also involved in the child welfare system and have years of expertise and national recognition for their work and programs. And so they're going to be available to work with the local implementation sites to assess technical assistance needs and training priorities based on strengths and provide those baseline training um, elements to staff. And so one piece of this includes an initial full day training, which covers connecting individuals' work to increasing the health and safety of LGBTQ2S young people in foster care, understanding the importance of focusing on sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression through statistics and through storytelling from young people and parent perspectives, explaining the impact of family work in the foster care context with this population of young, pe uh, young people, practice and practicing uh, transferable tools for a variety of foster care and child welfare settings. And so for this training, which there would be more information provided once sites are selected, 
again, there are no costs associated this, with this training for site. I'm going to pass this over to Elizabeth. Um, each local implementation site will receive evaluation support throughout and duration of the grant, including access to national experts from diverse communities in child welfare research and program evaluation, collaborative support in developing detailed, site-specific, culturally appropriate evaluation plans, research methodologies, and logic models. It will receive support in identifying data collection measures, instruments, and protocols, assistance with designing a culturally appropriate sampling strategy, assistance with enhancing local capacity for data collection and management, individualized technical assistance on data collection, monitoring, and evaluation, site-specific and cross-site implementation reports, regular meetings to review findings and trends, and to provide ongoing support um, with sites with adherence to data collection and cleaning protocols. You'll also receive support from youth experts in hiring and training youth in evaluation and participatory research. Great. Um, so I know everyone's interested in talking about the money. Um, so uh, this section is about funding. Um, again, you know, I just want to reiterate the importance of making sure that you check out the um, sample contractual agreement that we provided um, as we move forward because that's going to be a requirement before we can ever get to funding. Um, the funding amount is actually going to vary depending on the number of sites that are selected. It could range anywhere from 100,000 to 300,000. It's really hard to give an exact number um, because we don't know what sites are going to request and how many sites we're actually going to select. Um, we do anticipate providing allocated funding um, five times. So um, this means that sites are actually going to receive funding twice in their first year, which will help support the initial rollout costs. So we expect to provide funding in September of 2017, December of 2017, eight, December of 2018, December of 2019, and December of 2020. Um, and again, all of I'm giving you expected dates. We're going to work very hard to make sure that that happens by those dates, but we also need to have signed contracts. That's going to get in the way before we can ever actually provide funding. Um, but um, those are our goals. So uh, next section is site selection process. Um, we will receive all of the applications by April 28th, and we're going to review the applications with the Children's Bureau during that first week in May. Our goal is to prioritize the selection of sites that represent variation in system type, organization and staffing structure, size of population of focus, placement types, permanency goals for the selected population, geographic representation, uh, variation proposed interventions and organizational commitment to and capacity for implementing the proposed interventions. So we are looking to have some diversity among the different sites. Um, the quick team is going to narrow the pool of applicants and we may contact finalists to arrange a final virtual interview um, in early May if we have some questions before making final decisions, but we want to make sure that sites are notified um, before the end of May. For the scoring criteria, this is in the documentation and actually on the application that you've seen. So we've walked through all of the different categories um, in detail of what the expectation are, and these are how we're going to score it. The NATAM population is 10 points. The intervention model is 20 points. Evaluation feasibility and capacity is 20 points. The implementation plan is 20 points, as well as the local implementation site commitment to the quick. Uh, key personnel is five points, and the budget narrative is five points. Um, again, back to some time frames, as I mentioned, the local implementation site will be selected in May of 2017. Um, we expect that the sites are going to complete their implementation plans between May and July of 2017. Um, the local implementation sites will receive technical assistance from us in developing those implementation plans, so we know that the ones that you develop as part of this proposal will need to be tweaked um, and that you're going to need to develop logic models and more enhanced research methodologies and evaluation plans, et cetera. Um, we don't expect you to have all of that ready um, in complete, finalized entirety when you submit this application. And so we're going to spend that time 
working with you to make sure that you have finalized plans as well as finalizing the contractual agreements during that time period. Um, we are aiming for the local implementation sites to begin implementation in August of 2017. Um, and then depending on continued federal funding, which we right now don't anticipate an end to, um, but the quick uh, local projects will continue through September 2021 um, with those 12-month budget periods. So we'll be expecting to kind of have a reporting process that will occur uh, each year on the work that's being done and what's anticipated for the next fiscal year. And that's it. That's a lot of really technical information. And so I also just want to say that, you know, we are a group of people that are very passionate about this population. We care deeply about this. We were grateful to have received this contract to be able to do the work and, and to engage in it in this way. And the Children's Bureau has been phenomenal in supporting this as well. We are very excited to dig in and work with sites and to really create you know, a better quality of life for young people who may not have experienced that to date in the foster care system. And so we're very excited to do this work with those of you who are going to apply and be selected. Um, so with that, we are going to um, allow you to unmute your phones if you have any questions. And we are going to do our best to answer those questions. If for some reason that we don't have an answer and want to make sure that we need to get clarity, We'll provide that answer to everyone who registered for this webinar, um, and we'll provide it on the website. Um, and so if you have a question that you would like to ask verbally, you need to press star six to unmute your line, and you can ask the question. You can also type your question in the question in the chat box, and we will do our best to figure this out. As people ask questions verbally or in the chat box, we will answer them in the order that we see or hear them. So again, just press star six if you have a question. So we have a question. Can you expand a little on what activities and at what level you'd like to see already in place at a potential local implementation site? It's kind of hard to answer that question. I think, you know, and this is kind of what I said, we don't want to, you know, getting an application from a site that has, hasn't done anything is just not, they're not going to get selected. Uh, there's just no way that we have the time and the ability to provide that level of support that you need because it's already going to be a challenge in a lot of areas to find the support locally um, to work with this population of youth. So if you already have something that started, and that might be something that's a collaboration or training that you've provided to staff or policy changes that have happened within your agencies, um, a commitment across partners to actually do this work and better serve this population, um, changes in your language and your assessment forms or your intake forms. Um, those are the kind of things that we'd like to see that you've already thought this through and um, you've started making changes and you kind of know what the need is out there um, and how you'd like to address it. So we have another question. Uh, somehow I missed how much of the evaluation is collaboration around implementation of designs and tools that are coming from the national team and how much is locally designed. Um, can you please clarify? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll actually work with each implementation site on um, creating your evaluation plan and your implementation plan um, and with the uh, consideration development or um, what we finalize for data collection measures. Um, so you may have some ideas in mind um, as a local implementation site, and we would, of course, work with that. We would bring our expertise on um, uh, through our literature view and knowledge of the field of what works best with the population and might have some suggestions for you that we would collaborate with you on kind of all phases of the evaluation. And the next question, are there any budget limitations on the evaluation component if you have to hire an external evaluator? Um, so uh, we, I, I hope that this makes sense, but in a lot of ways we are going to function as your external evaluator um, to centralize it because we know that there's limited funding and we also know that sites often have limited capacity. 
to have an external evaluator? Do you want to elaborate on that? Right. So with our expertise, um, we would be able to do all your analyses for you. So as I mentioned before, we would be able to work with you on developing your evaluation plan, um, but in essence, we would also be your evaluator. So we would be working with you on data collection, but maybe the quick research team would actually be doing the analyses um, because we are aware of the budget constraints and that um, sites may not want to or may not be able to um, budget in hiring an external evaluator. So the quick research team will function as, in that role for each LIS. So the next question is how will the information learned from this project be disseminated to the general public? And that's a great question that we did not talk about at all, but we have an entire plan around that. Um, so the biggest piece of that is that the end goal is to develop, to develop a catalog, and that catalog would include all the protocols that are established, the instruments that are used to assess fidelity um, for each of these interventions, what worked, what didn't work. Um, we also anticipate sort of doing a process to where we identify common elements that are effective in this work so that we know, you know, all of the sites might be doing something um, related to engagement um, of young people who are transgender. And it's really effective and we can see that, that across all of the different projects that this common element of engagement has shown to be successful. We also want to make sure that those elements are pulled out um, that um, could be implemented more broadly, even if a site isn't going to implement an intervention um, that requires a more level of intensity, that there are certain practices that can be pulled out that can be effective to be implemented at any child welfare system to support the needs of these young people. Um, so in addition to that catalog, we'll be doing um, webinars, providing resources, fact sheets around our evaluation data, we anticipate publishing within scholarly journals so that the information is also out there within academia. Um, we have a goal of wanting to do a video series so that we can actually go on site and video young people um, and their caregivers and the people who are working with them um, so that in addition to what people can see on paper around how you implement, they can also hear from the people who are actually doing it and living it and how effective it was and what helped and what didn't help. Um, we plan on doing an animated um, monthly uh, little video short. So as we learn information from this process, we'll be sending information out to the field. And it's like, you know, a one to two minute animated short on a specific topic. And then within that, we would provide resources on that topic. So more information is getting out to the field. And I think we're also going to learn, you know, that we're going to learn along the way and get information from you and from others on what's the best way to get this info out. But we definitely have a plan and a commitment to make sure it's disseminated to the general public. Oh, and one of the other elements around the common elements and pulling that out is to do um, an online uh, training that would be accessible to anyone to where people can go on. And so they wouldn't be trained on the specific protocols. They would be trained on the common elements that we see that are effective across all of the different interventions. And that would be something that could be useful with any child welfare agency again. Okay. Um, so the next question, are, are sites able to hire an external evaluator to consult on aspects of evaluation, budget permitting, um, or is that not allowed? Uh, Taffy, I'm going to call on you. I don't know if there's any restrictions around that or not. Are you available to answer that question? I'm sorry. You'll have to repeat it. I, was, uh, I have a little problem with my keyboard I was trying to fix. Repeat the question gotcha. for me. Sure. Um, uh, are sites able to hire an external evaluator to consult on aspects of evaluation, budget permitting, or is that not allowed? Um, so here's what I would say to that. Um, we, haven't, we haven't given a specific limitation or allowance on that. Um, Marlene, I believe we have a, a ceiling of what each project would be able to receive at most. Uh -huh. um, that's 300,000. Yes, that would be at most. And so you have to think that within the context of how much money you may be able to get for this, um, how much realistically you would spend on evaluation consulting type services uh, and be able to justify that that is a need 
uh, knowing that there will be a number of evaluation supports that would be provided directly by the QUIC. Thank you. Kathy, while you're responding, there's another question on budget restrictions. Are there any restrictions in what the budget should cover? Other than what I highlighted, is there anything else that you want to mention um, related to budget restrictions? Um, that's a pretty broad question. I, I, I can't think of something uh, right off the top of my head. Okay. And we can, uh, if there is any responses that we're not answering right now, we can also provide more information if we think that there's something that we've missed. Um, okay. We also have a question about the sampling strategy. We are a county-administered child welfare agency. Our target population may not be as large as a state or a larger urban municipality? Are you interested in sites that may not serve as many LGBTQ youth? We do not have established need and program. We do. We do. Oh, I'm sorry. We do. I'm, I'm reading this from very far away across the room. Um, <clears throat> um, so I think the first part of this answer, um, I don't, you know, I'm not, I don't know if you have an answer around sampling about what an appropriate size. The evaluators are looking at each other in the room right now. Yeah. Uh, in a, can I can I say something yeah. while you're Please. so w one uh, the the sampling size of course would have to be sufficient to be able to show how you would affect systemic change and I'll let the evaluators talk about that a little bit more. Um, I think the second piece is programmatically, if, if the, the state would be able, the state child welfare agency would be able to um, apply to do the work in some specific areas. So by being the state agency, you would not have to necessarily immediately implement all across the state. Part of what we would be looking at and, and talking about is that this is why we wanted the lead agency to be a child welfare um, agency, so that if you implement in a number of transition zones, you are also then able to um, uh, talk about how it is that you would create that systemic change um, by furthering the implementation from initially working with those specified, say, counties, regions, districts, uh, whatever the area might be, how you're going to take uh, those findings and information and as part of your sustainability, then walk it across to the other areas within the state's uh, jurisdiction. Hopefully Great, that you. gives you some information, and then I don't know if your evaluators would like to touch back on the sample piece. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to touch on that and answer. Another question is, is there a target number of individuals to be served? So in terms of the number of served and sampling strategy, um, those really are intervention dependence. It depends what you're picking. And you know, some sites may pick a really intense intervention um, that may not you know, be designed to serve hundreds of kids or something like that. So it's a little bit uh, dependent upon your approach and your justification for your intervention. Um, and in, in terms of is there a target number or a number of, you know, minimum number to serve, um, we don't have that in mind, but there's not a, a minimum number. What we have in mind is that you have enough so that we can show that um, there's statistical significance. We can do that um, by kind of standard analyses and effect sizes, um, but the, with the goal of being that the, we're, this intervention has been completed on an, enough participants where we can um, comfortably talk about the findings, again, that they're statistically significant um, and that there's enough there. So the next question is, is there any expectation or limitation about the budget amount requested for the first period of activity, September through November? And so I'm not, I'm not entirely sure how to answer this question. I think if you're thinking about this from doing your budget for this application, that you shouldn't worry about separating the budget in between those two periods and just do it annually. Um, 
and to do it annually with the two uh, the two iterations of funding. So for example, if you are saying that your site needs $300,000 a year to do this implementation, that for that first budget year, you would include 600,000. I think may be the best way to do it. We can think about that and we'll provide a response if it's different because um, we haven't, I haven't actually thought that through. Um, when we get to a point to where we're going to be giving you the money, we're going to work out individually with each site what the scope is going to be and what your deliverables are going to be for that period so that you'll have done those deliverables so that we can provide you with that funding through the university. So we'll work that out individually once we get to a place of actually giving you money. Um, but for your budgets, I think um, it may make sense to just combine that first two funding iterations as though it's one year of funding and then do four years annually of um, a budget. Does that answer your question and make sense? I hope so. If not, ask it again. Um, the next question is, my agency is a private nonprofit uh, contracted by the Department of Children and Families in Florida that's responsible for 100% of child welfare services. Can we be the lead? Um, no, you cannot be the lead. Um, so in Florida, um, we've gotten quite a few questions from Florida act actually around eligibility. And so uh, the state child welfare agency would still need to be the lead. Now they can determine that they want to um, partner with you and to implement this within the region in which you're responsible for the care of those young people. Um, but the uh, state agency in Tallahassee would need to be the lead applicant. If the state entity is the applicant, can the initial work or effort be done in a region or does it have to be done across the straight state during the grant period? No, I think it can be done within a region. I don't think. I mean, we know that there's states that are fairly large and implementing something in this amount of time across the state would be very difficult. So identifying a specific region would be fine and appropriate. You would just need to be able to, to describe why that region and be able to ensure that your sample size will be sufficient for the intervention that you're going to implement. Uh, and can I add one thing to that, please? Sure, yeah. Um, I, I think in addition to that, you would need to ensure that there is a sufficient uh, population in the region or regions selected that you can then justify using that as a platform for the continued or additional systemic change that we would expect that would come from this. So if, for example, um, you were to say, I would like to apply this to uh, a major metropolitan area, then the question is, do, are you getting enough information from working within that one area that when it comes to looking at creating systemic change, you can extrapolate the findings and what comes out of that work to even your rural areas, or if you're way out west to your frontier areas, et cetera. So what we normally see is rather than just one area uh, where it is harder to say that that would then be able to uh, help or support creating systemic change, uh, most grantees, when we've looked at, when we've provided similar grant structures before, will look at two to five what I'll call transformation zones, which is where they do that initial implementation within a, a several areas that have some variation in what they look like, how they're structured, what the population is like, to give them a better sense of how those strategies would work in different scenarios so that then they can look at uh, towards the end of the grant. Now, how do we look at infusing this across the entire state? Great, thank you. Elizabeth, did you have yes. something you wanted to add? Yeah, so one other thing that um, for the evaluation section you may, sites may want to consider, is you may want to include a power analysis for those of you who are concerned about your sample size and number served. Um, and there's actually free software available, it's called G-Power. Um, you can Google it and you can locate that and it's a free download and everything. Um, but the power analysis will give you an idea of how, of your effect size um, and then sample size that you would need to serve to be able to have um, statistical significance. 
great. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions that people have that they want to ask? We see some folks typing, so we'll give you a chance to type out your question. Would the Children's Services Council, an independent taxing authority, be con considered for a lead? I'm not sure I know how to answer that question. Taffy, do you know how to answer that question? Um, I, I, without having additional information, it sounds something like the uh, community-based care agencies um, who are responsible for providing the child welfare services on behalf of the Department of Children and Families at, at a particular state. Um, which they are not able to um, directly be the lead on this grant. So it sounds similar. So without having more information, I'm going to say no. It must be the um, uh, state uh, or, or county uh, government agency that is responsible for providing those child welfare services, not another organization that they may c contract with to do it on their behalf. Great, thank you. Uh, we, as you can see in the chat box, we just um, included the link um, to where you can download the G-Power free software. Does anyone have any additional questions before we? Close the call. OK. Um, well, thank you all very much for joining. If you do have additional questions, you have the email address to the QUIC. And we have someone who's monitoring that um, regularly. So we'll get back to you within 24 hours with a response. Um, if we have any additional questions, we'll also get the answers to those questions out to the full group and post them on our website. This webinar will be recorded and will be posted online as well at some point tomorrow, hopefully within 24 hours, to the Quick website. Um, and uh, thank you all. Taffy, did you have anything you wanted to say before we close? No, I just want to say that I do look forward uh, to the applications that we will receive uh, and the work that we'll be able to do uh, with the Quick and our partners 